If the kids love it, the teachers will figure it out because they want to do what's best for kids. I mean, that's why they're teachers. You know, everybody can learn a little bit about quantum, but they don't have to know it all. It's enough to get excited about it. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. Quantum technologies impact everything from weather forecasting to traffic optimization and medical equipment taking advantage of the complex quantum mechanics that occur at the scale of molecules, atoms, and electrons. The quantum information science technology market is forecast to be worth $44 billion by 2028, according to some estimations. A quantum-educated workforce will be essential in the future. However, most students are not introduced to quantum mechanics until taking physics courses late in their college careers. A new program called Quantum for All is seeking to change that by exposing K-12 students to quantum concepts relevant in things they experience every day, such as in credit card security, phones, and computers, regardless of whether they ever take a physics class. We're joined by Karen Jo Metzler, assistant professor in practice and master teacher in the UTeach program at the University of Texas at Arlington, where she leads the Quantum for All initiative. Dr. Metzler, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is exciting. So what is Quantum for All? So Quantum for All is, is it started out as just kind of a joke, for, for lack of a better word, because uh, we were kind, when we were doing the workshops for teachers, and they um, didn't know what it was about, we said, oh, it's for everybody. Everybody can figure this out. So we just kind of came up with, you know, Quantum for All um, to try to make it broader. Uh, it, anybody can do it. We have... We've, we've taught elementary teachers. We've taught middle school teachers. Now, I can't say we've taught third graders and so forth down. You know, I know they have the quantum baby book and so forth, but that's, to me, another thing. But, you know, you just have to, to look at it as being everybody can understand it on some level. And so that's where it came from. I understand a trip circa 2012 is what captured your imagination. And I'm curious what about that trip and the story that really – inspired you to get into teaching quantum topics to students? Well, I had been uh, involved with AAPT and some place, you know, some professional organizations basically trying to learn. And in 2012, they had a teacher workshop up in Canada at Perimeter Institute. And I thought, well, I'll go do that. And I felt like I was the biggest dummy in the group. You know, they, they were talking about stuff I had no clue and then one of the things was we went over to the Institute for Quantum Computing, and that both of them just kind of blew me away. I was just like, "Oh my goodness, I'm so stupid! How did how did I not know this? How did I not teach my kids?" And I was I was really a little depressed about it. And came back to the states, and you know, talking to peers, I'm like, "Oh no, we don't teach that." I'm like, "What do you mean we don't we don't teach that? They teach it in Spain and France." I mean, they were like. Well, 30 countries there. And they're like, well, we just don't do that in the United States. And I was like, well, that didn't seem quite right. <laughs> so I just kind of started doing it on my own. I tried to get uh, some people to maybe, you know, support teachers to, to learn about this because you can't obviously send them all to, to the Premier Institute. And no one was really interested. And so it really wasn't until that quantum initiative was passed that someone mm-hmm. said, oh, maybe we should teach them. I'm like, yeah, you're about 10 years too late, 15. But, but that's what started. It was my own recognition that I didn't know this stuff. I certainly mm-hmm. know how to teach it. But it was fascinating. And I thought, well, well, number one, if I'm fascinated by it, you know the kids are going to be. And number two, if I don't know it and other teachers don't know it, you know it's not being taught because they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. You know, right? And for I think for the audience that doesn't know what we're talking about, can you give like a short explanation of what quantum means? <laughs> That's the million dollar word, isn't it? Um, it's basically how things uh, work on the very, very, very smallest scale that we know. And the truth of the matter is, we don't know why some things do what they do, but we know. The probability of something happening and that adds to the mystery of it. So there's a lot of unknown, and I think that's one of the reasons why teachers are hesitant to teach it because they feel like mm. they need to, you know, we need to know everything before we teach the kids. And you finally have to just say, no, we don't know. But I mean, it's been around for over a hundred years. I think it's time we started teaching it. So 
trying to get like it's a long period of time from when you get excited about it to when the quantum initiatives are signed into law. Can you talk a little bit about difficulties trying to get peers and administrators on board? Like even after that was signed, did you have trouble with buy in from people? Yeah, we still do. We still do. Um, I always say if you want to stop conversation on an airplane, just tell them you teach quantum and that, you know, it shuts it down immediately. Um, it's a it's kind of like a mystery word. And so we have issues now trying to get teachers to come because they're like, oh, no, we don't do quantum. And I'm like, yeah, you do. You just don't know that's what you're doing. And so we try to kind of soften the word, but there's really no two ways of getting around it. Right. Um, I mean, it is what it is. And the kids aren't afraid of it. The kids think it's wonderful and they think it's fun. But the uh, the teachers are, are afraid of it. It's um, It's hard to explain. In just a few words, and there's so many niches of it that um, getting buy-in from teachers is really hard. And so, teachers, um, you know, being in K twelve my, my whole life, you know, they they have things that they need to teach, whether it be for testing or for district curriculum or whatever. And typically, this is not part of it, unless you show them tie-ins. You know, so you talk about atomic energy okay so why not tweak it a little bit talk about quantum you talk about um you talk about momentum you talk about doppler effect you talk about you know light all these things but do you talk about laser cooling no you don't because you don't ever put them all together right and so that's to me what is so intriguing is i'll listen to talks and so forth and i'm like oh wait they're talking about momentum. They're talking about double. That's, that's physics. Okay, if that's physics, then we can do that. Right, but it's really easy to get excited once you start talking about superposition and some of these concepts that seem like they shouldn't make sense but are in there and kind of do. <laughs> right. We hope to provide um, access, increase access, decrease fear so that everybody can learn it. You know, they don't have to have calculus to do it. Right. They, they, they can they can figure it out. As part of your Quantum for All project, you've got an NSF grant. And I have to ask you, what difference has that grant made for you? What has it allowed you to do that you might not have been able to do otherwise? Well, it allowed me to do what I wanted to do, and that was show teachers that this can be done in their classrooms. Um, you know, before I had done things at conferences, you know, here and there and so forth. But if you want something that is sustainable, it has to be enough that they can take it back to their classroom and feel confident doing it. And that takes time. It, it doesn't come with a hour session, you know, at a conference when they don't have the perspective. Um, it doesn't even come. Uh, I, I get a little frustrated sometimes when people say, oh, we do outreach. We bring the teachers in and we tell them about quantum okay, that doesn't give them a way to take it back to their kids. I mean, they can't mm. replicate that lecture. So um, having them be able to engage in it, test it, try it, learn to love it, and embed it in their classroom. You know, I couldn't do that without the NSF funds. Um, there's, I don't, I'm a teacher. I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we tried to provide them with not only support in terms of come here, you know, we're not paying them a, a huge amount of money. It's basically, you know, like they're traveling stuff and some equipment to take back. And that equipment engages the kids. And when teachers see kids engage, they're all over it. Because if the kids love it, the teachers will figure it out because they want to do what's best for kids. I mean, that's why they're teachers. So NSF has allowed us to do that. So you talked about some of the tools that you're sending back. What does that look like? What kind of things are teachers getting to take to the classrooms for that engagement? We uh, partnered with the Institute for Quantum Computing, and they came up with this wonderful model that allows us to show the kids basically what that superposition is and how it can be encrypted and and Alice and Bob, and if Eve is eavesdropping, you know, can she intercept the message? And they they did it in such a way that uh, the materials can be 3D printed. And so the total cost is less than 200 bucks. 
Well, teachers can afford that. You know, that's something that, that can go in the classroom. And so um, that's one of the things. Uh, we've used Geiger counters to talk about probability. So they get to take those back. Uh, we have some interferometers made that are very, very small scale, but they, they work beautifully in showing them how the beams are split and reflected and, and go back. And so things like that to basically help engage uh, kids. And very cool. So they're not, not expensive because teachers don't have a big budget. So from there, you have the summer summer workshop, summer camp program that you talked about a little bit, or you mentioned that exists. Can you tell us a little bit about what those workshops look like? Typically, teachers go to AP workshops, conferences, and so forth, where they learn for like a week, or usually it's even two weeks, which is a long time. And then they go back to their classroom and are expected to do this, you know, six months later or whatever. And that doesn't always work. <laughs> Because just like kids, uh, my analogy is that when, when teachers are teaching math, they don't wait till the end of the unit to test the kids and see what they know. They test them all the way through, right? So that they can address misconceptions, you know, things that aren't right. And so we do a small chunk. We do four days. And you say, well, that's a weird number. Well, it's easier to get them there for four days than five. Don't ask me why, but it is. Could you have a travel day? You know, they're not having to be gone on Sunday to get to get there. So we do four days and then we give them a break because it literally messes with their mind so much. They're just tired. They're emotionally, physically tired. And then they turn around and what they learn, they teach the kids at the STEM camp. So that means that they are taking what they learned. They are practicing it on kids that they don't know. So there's no threat, there's no test, there's, you know, nothing intimidating about it. And the the beauty of it is these teachers work in groups. And so there may be three of us that are teaching a topic for an hour and a half. If if I'm not real sure about the whole kit and caboodle, I can say, oh, could you do this? Because I'm not very comfortable with it. And then I'll watch how they do it. And so I not only am learning from the initial workshop, I'm learning from watching my peers teach it. I'm learning from the questions they ask. I'm learning from the questions the kids ask. So it's this total immersion process where we, we try to reduce the threat and the intimidation and just just get in there and do it. You, you can't mess it up. You know, it, it's not being done anyway, so just, just do it anyway. Um, and so that's what it looks like. And then the last day of the camp, the kids get to choose which activities they liked best. And we set those up in a, in a big room or whatever. And their parents, grandparents, friends, whoever, are invited to come by. And the kids explain to their peers, family, whatever, what they learned. And I'm not going to get emotional, but as a teacher, that hour is so, so powerful to hear these kids explain the stuff that you're just like, don't tell me they can't learn it because you nailed it. And they didn't practice. They just decided that day that's what they wanted. And particularly when you've got kids that have been kind of shy and they haven't said a whole lot, and then they've got, you know, five family members over there and they have their mom and their dad doing this and that and, you know, whatever. That's, it's so exciting to see that and it kind of re it kind of is the reason okay I can do this we can, we can keep doing this and the the teachers get excited about that and then they're like I'm gonna take this back and do it in my classroom and that's what it's all about right um can you tell me a little bit about uh so so some of these these are like high school these are younger people that haven't really had physics classes no. what kinds of things are you exposing them to and specifically i'm curious about what is resonating with them what are they getting excited about oh do you have any examples that come to mind you probably heard of maglev trains okay well they're they're pretty cool literally i mean you're the basically floating um on this suspension, this magnetic suspension, they also use uh, some quantum levitation. But we we have the kids design a, a maglev car that has to go 
uh, down a track in a certain amount of time, supporting a certain amount of weight. And they really get into that and so forth. And we say, well, what if we wanted to add 70 times that weight on here? And they're like, oh, it's not going to support that. And we're like, well, then how do maglev trains work? Because they don't have wheels and so forth. And just like, hmm. So we literally uh, have some very small versions again of, of what quantum levitation is. So we have this little puck, you know, the and you and you cool it down and you show them that it supports and it just supports and it supports and, and they're just like they're amazed, you know, and they they can't believe that that little bitty wafer can support that much weight. And so we try to do things like that that are kind of gotchas. Um, this summer we did. We were trying to do a historical perspective and mostly for the teachers to help them see how things developed over the years and who did what. And so one of the things we started with was a particle. What is a particle? How do you know what a particle is? You know, what does it do and so forth? Well, then it goes to CERN, right? And most kids have heard about CERN, but they don't really know what it is. Well, how do you get those particles to turn and go in a circle and so forth? So we gave them uh, Hot Wheels tracks with those little spin things, you know, that spin it out. And, and they had to make the car, you know, get faster and faster and faster. And then we took some solenoids and we lined them up and put a car with a magnet on it. And they had to figure out <clears throat> when they had to turn the current off and on and so forth in order to get to speed up. And so, I mean, they were all over that too and showing their parents how it works. So did that teach them everything about CERN? No. But that wasn't the point. The point was to show them that we can take something and we we talk about cars speeding up and both, but that they're not used to speeding something up using a magnetic field. And that's important when we're talking about quantum. So you kind of get get them to doing things that they're now, well, well, how do you do this? And so we went from that to then learning about the particles and how do you find the particles and what happens with these trails that they leave it. They did an amazing job. The kids didn't want to stop. We were like, we need to move on. They're like, no, 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 we're not done. So <laughs> that's what we did. Very cool. Like, uh, like that's so great. Like, you really just need to set the pieces and then the, they can go from there. But like getting that first piece to where it, it's consumable, where they can like get excited by it, that's fantastic. Well, it's taking, it's taking what the professors and their research places know, right? And you have this gap between what they know and what the high school or the K-12 kids know. And so I see my job as being, I know both ends of it. I've been at both ends. And my job is to try to make a connection there that this is what they do. This is laser cooling. This is what you do. Let's put it together. So that's what we do. Uh, so the next question is, where are these workshops? If you're, if you're a random parent or student or teacher listening to this podcast right now, where do they learn more? Well, we uh, have information on the website, but we brought teachers to Arlington because that's where I am and because it's nice and cool here in the summer, right? <laughs> and um, the teachers are taught here, but then the teachers can go back. And NSF helped us support them to do that in their districts. So for some of them, that's where they saw it. For those in Arlington, it started out just being basically students at one school. And this past summer, we had kids driving over an hour each way to come to these workshops. And so it's spreading. Um, we would like to see a way to scale this up, you know, so that it can be done in any area of the country. But um as, as you're aware, we have to make sure that what we're doing is going to work. Uh, writing this and getting it off, piecing this together has not been an easy task. It's been one of the hardest things I've probably ever done. And so we want to test it with us, test it in the classroom, excuse me, and then see if we can get, you know, it spread out further. But it's going to take a big effort. And people need to realize that and it's not going to happen overnight. But if we can get a model that works, then hey, let's let's try something. But we're but we're hoping to expand it. We'll we'll see what happens. Special thanks to Karen Joe Matzler. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the US National Science Foundation is advancing research at NSF.gov. <laughs>